let's talk about simple pendulums. First, let's uh, review what simple harmonic motion is all about, and then uh, we'll draw a free body diagram of a simple pendulum. And from that, we're going to get an equation that almost uh, looks like uh, the equation for simple harmonic motion. We're going to use a little trick that physicists use uh, quite often um, called the small angle approximation to actually turn that force equation into uh, a simple harmonic motion. We'll see that a simple pendulum uh, does give us simple harmonic motion. And then we'll figure out uh, how to calculate the period of a simple pendulum. But first, let's talk about what a simple pendulum is. A simple pendulum is just a little mass on a string. So here we have like a, a ceiling or a roof or something, and we get a, or you can just be holding a string, and you get a string like this, and you put a mass on it. Now, what makes this a simple pendulum is that the mass of the string is uh, almost insignificant. Well, is insignificant compared to the mass of the, uh, you know, the, the 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 mass at the bottom of your pendulum here. And also, um, it's uh, this object can, is treated like a particle. Uh, in other words, its size is small compared to the length of the string. So if you have that situation, a, a relatively light string and a big chunky mass at the bottom of it, you can treat it like a simple pendulum and you'll get pretty good results. Now one of the things we have to do is define uh, uh, an angle here. Here we have an angle theta and a length L and a mass M. So these are the um, parameters we're going to use for a simple pendulum. Okay, now first uh, let's, uh, let's do a little bit of review of uh, what simple harmonic motion is. Remember, uh, we used the mass spring system before uh, to, to introduce a simple uh, har harmonic oscillator, uh, but Actually, we said that any time where the second derivative, and here we use x, and normally x means position, and it does in this case, if we had a mass spring system. If the second derivative, uh, uh, time derivative of this variable is equal to negative omega squared times x. Now omega here is a constant and here is the original function x. So when the second derivative uh, of a function gives you back the original function but it's now it's negative and it's got this constant in front of it, that's when you've got simple harmonic motion. And remember the solution to this is a sine or a cosine wave. Right? I mean a uh, uh, that is the solution to this, what we call a differential equation. Um, let's, let's review that. Uh, if I have uh, x is equal to a cosine omega t, right? If I take the first derivative, dx dt, and um, I'm going to take the derivative of this so that you keep the a, and then you have to take the use the chain rule and take the derivative of the inside part, and the derivative of omega t with respect to t is just omega times the uh, now what is the derivative of cosine omega t? Well, that's going to be negative sine omega t. So that's our first derivative. Now we just need to do it again. We'll take the derivative of this, and we write it that way. And uh, now we'll take the derivative of the inside part again, and we get another omega, but we have an omega to start with. So we have negative a omega squared um, times the, uh, now the derivative of sine is uh, cosine omega t. And look what we got here. Uh, we've got the second derivative, is it, and take a look at this, a 
cosine omega t. A cosine omega t. This is just x. So this gives me negative omega squared times x. So th this really defines it. And, and by the way, if you go A sine omega t uh, and go through the same thing, you'll get the same answer. So uh, it's a sine or a cosine wave. So basically what we're saying here is that if we have a simple pendulum, like I drew, and if I hold this mass here and I release it, it's going to swing back and forth. And if I trace the path that this makes over time, it should look like a sine wave or a cosine wave. Now, um, one thing you can do right now is pause the video and get a, a little mass and a string and uh, let it oscillate back and forth. And you'll see that if you keep the angle fairly small and you trace it out uh, over time, you know, if I, if I you know, trace this out, I will get a, a, a kind of a cosine or a sine wave, a sinusoidal wave. All right. Well, let's uh, show that. Let's let's prove it. Okay. Let's do it. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to draw a free body diagram of this guy right here. And so um, here's my mass. Right. Now here's my my string. Right. And that gives me a tension force like this. So there's my tension force. And of course gravity is pulling down on it, right? So this is mg. Now I'm going to put an axis system on here. So we'll make this, uh, this is the x and this is the y direction. Now this tension force now has a, a component that is, well, I'll tell you what we'll do. Um, we're going to kind of take a look at the string here. We're going to look at the component of the weight that's making this thing swing. Now, let's take a look at the weight, uh, the force here, uh, I mean the, the weight. We can take this weight and break it up into a component that is going to basically uh, cancel out this this uh, tension force here because if you think about it I mean this is a string and the string is not going to stretch so there can be no acceleration in the direction of the string but uh, perpendicular to the string there can be uh, an acceleration right perpendicular like this so it's going to look like that and of course here we get a right triangle and this right here is the net force. This is the force that's going to cause this thing to accelerate. Well, uh, if this is, uh, let's do a little geometry. Here's uh, theta up here uh, and therefore theta will be here and so this is going to be this net force right here is mg sine theta, right? Because it's the opposite leg of this right triangle. And so here's the weight vector broken up into a component that's along the string and perpendicular to the string. And it's this component that makes the pendulum swing back and forth. So this is going to be equal to ma. Now, one of the things that we need to uh, do is get this into a, a, a common formula, um, I mean a common variable, because look, here we have acceleration and here we have theta, and so, but one thing that we, we, we can express this in terms of uh, angular acceleration, right? We can say that um, we know that the acceleration is going to be equal to r times alpha. Now, um, and so there, therefore, the angular acceleration of this is going to be uh, the acceleration over the radius. Now, I'm going to make a variable change here. Uh, this radius, if we look back at our original drawing, the radius of this uh, circle, really, is the length of the pendulum. So I'm going to call this... Um, uh, 
well, I'm going to call, I'm going to make a substitution. The acceleration equals, instead of R times alpha, I'm going to call it L times alpha. And I'll put that in there. So here we have mg sine theta is equal to uh, L times, or ML times alpha. Mass times L times alpha. And of course, I could have just canceled the mass out to begin with. And look what I got here. I've got uh, alpha is equal to, uh, let's divide both sides by L, and I get uh, G over L times sine theta. Now, here's the thing, though. If, if this acceleration is seeking to make the, the is always seeking to make the um, angular displacement uh, to trying to reduce it. It's always in the opposite direction. It's a restoring, right? If, if theta is like in this direction, the angular acceleration is in this direction. So they're always in opposite directions. And I can express that just by putting a negative here. That is, the angular acceleration is always trying to push, uh, pull this, this mass back towards a zero angle, is what that means. So here's my equation. Now, now remember, this is angular acceleration. And so now I've got d theta squared, or d, d squared theta, dt squared. That's what the angular acceleration is, is equal to negative g over l times sine theta. Now, does this look like simple harmonic motion? Not quite. Um, look, look over here. Um, we had the second derivative is equal to the original function times negative omega squared. Well, here we have the, the second derivative uh, is, well, we got this negative you know, constant here, but we don't have theta. We have sine theta. And this is kind of a problem. But we're going to use this very cool little thing called the um, small angle approximation. And I have a little task for you to do. Um, and I, I kind of have it set up right here. I want you to see something that's very cool about theta and sine theta. What happens when the angle gets really small? Well. Here's, the, uh, here's what I want you to do. I've, I've, I've made this little table like this. And here I've got a whole bunch of angles. And what I want you to do is convert those angles to radians. So convert them to radians. And then, using your calculator, make sure your calculator is in the radian mode. Take the sine of the angle. okay? And do that for these angles. It should take you about five minutes or so to do that. And uh, so pause the video right now and make this, you know, fill out this little chart and see what you get. So pause it right now. Okay, uh, now let's uh, see what happens. Well, um, to, to turn um, the angle in degrees into radians, of course, you... Um, uh, multiply by 2 pi and divide by 360. Uh, we covered that unit conversion before, so I'm not going to do that now. But you should have gotten these values for the... Um, let me zoom in a little bit. Okay. You should have gotten these values for theta. And then... For sine theta, something very cool happens. Look at this. Let's take the sine of 0.5236 radians. When you take the sine of that, you get 0.5. Now, this is pretty close. 0.5236 is pretty close to being 0.5. Yeah, but it's, it's significantly off. I don't know. What is that, about 5% off? Well, let's do 20 degrees. But 20 degrees is 0.3491. And now we get 0.5. Uh, 3, 4, 2, 0. Let me take the sine of that. Now, look at how close these two numbers are. 
This is only about 2%. Uh, this is about 2% smaller than this. Let's do it for 10 degrees. Look at that. 0.1745 radians. When you take the sine of it, you get 0.1736. Now that's about a half a percent difference. And then we keep going. Here's 5 degrees. 4 degrees, 3 degrees, look at how close these are. And finally, 1 degree. If you have 1 degree, if you carry it out to 4 significant figures, they're the same number. Now this is really a cool thing, because, uh, look, the world is complicated, but one of the things physicists try to do is they try to make it simple. We try to simplify things. So we're going to make this small angle approximation. If you have uh, an angle that's less than 10 degrees, you're going to have, you're going to be okay within a half a percent or less than half a percent off. So what we can say for small angles, theta is approximately equal to sine theta. Now this is only true, this is only true in radians. It's not true in degrees or revolution. So make sure that your angle is in radians and, and therefore uh, I mean, that's an assumption we're going to use here. Well, if we can make that small angle approximation, we can say, well, theta is pretty much equal to sine theta, and voila, look, d squared theta, dt squared equals negative g over l times the, times, well, instead of sine theta, we're just going to put theta. Now, this isn't really truly equal. I mean, you probably should say it's approximately equal. But you know what? If the angle is small, if the angle is small, it's, it's good enough. Okay, so we're going to use this. And now we can say that, oh, look, here's a constant. Here's, here's a, you know, our gravitational field strength, and this is the length of the pendulum. This gives us omega squared. So uh, this is omega squared, and so therefore omega is equal to the square root of g. On Earth, it's 9.8 meters per second squared divided by the length in meters of our pendulum. And uh, so this uh, gives us um, the uh, angular frequency. Of course, you can calculate the frequency and then the period. Remember, we said that the period that is, the time for one complete oscillation is equal to uh, uh, 2 pi over omega, right? And uh, so we're going to put that in there. That's 2 pi over the square root of g over l. But that doesn't look very pretty. So let's zoom back out. So the period of the swing of a simple pendulum is equal to 2 pi times the square root of L over G. And so here's a very important equation. And um, um, so let's take a look at everything here and kind of review. We have this this definition for what simple harmonic motion is, right? It's a sine or a cosine wave. And uh, and we drew a free body diagram, and we said, hey, look, the net force is equal to mg sine theta. Kind of reminds me of uh, an inclined plane, doesn't it? But anyway, uh, that's going to be equal to ma. But this is kind of swinging around like this, so we can get the acceleration in terms of the angular acceleration of uh, our simple pendulum, and that allows us to put everything in terms of, of the same variable, right, because alpha is equal to d squared theta dt squared, and uh, equals negative g over l times sine theta. Now, this, this is the exact equation. I mean, this is, this is great right here, um, but it, it's not simple harmonic motion. But if we notice that if, as long as your angle's in radians, if, you're, if your angle is very small, um, then your angle in radians is approximately equal to the sine of uh, the angle. And so uh, we can make this small angle approximation, and so therefore we can conclude 
that simple pendulums approximate uh, simple harmonic motion if you keep the angle really small. Basically, if you're less than 10 degrees, you're good. It's simple harmonic motion. That's it.